Hello, folks. Uh, my name is Samuel Heber from Samuel Heber YouTube page, uh, channel, I mean. Uh, Heber Family Adventures on Instagram, SamuelHeber.net, Samuel Heber on Facebook. I'm here today with Tara Reagan, uh, who has an Instagram called Autism Grow Up. Tara, can you tell the folks a bit about yourself? Yeah, happy to. So happy to be here, too. So excited for our chat today, too, Sam. Um, so here's the thing. I am a sibling. I have two brothers on the spectrum, Tyler and Tanner. Tyler's 28 and Tanner's 20. And they were uh, just approaching adulthood when I really started getting into the autism field. I tried out a number of different areas within autism. I was spent a lot of time in special education with them, volunteering in their classrooms growing up. I also got into rec therapy and working at camps for people on the spectrum and then social work. And then that led me to my PhD program in special education focused on those teen years and adulthood years. So as my brothers were reaching that time period of exiting high school services, that's really where I got the idea to start Autism Grown Up uh, to share a bit about our experiences navigating a, the adulthood service system and getting off the Medicaid IDD waiver list. And uh, that became a nonprofit and a resource center. So that's what I do today. And it's really fun. That, that's amazing. What, how did your brothers react to having their uh, sister in their classroom all the time? It didn't. They were pretty happy about it, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we we're actually very, very close as a family and um, feel like I have a really, really unique bond with both of my brothers. We, we're classically siblings in a lot of ways. We do pull a lot of pranks on each other and a lot of jokes, uh, but they do. We I don't know. We just really enjoy spending time with each other all the time and actually uh, there's a period of time in elementary school where Tyler and I were two years apart. We were in the same school, which doesn't happen a lot with four kids spread across nine years. Mm -hmm. And his classroom was actually across the hallway from my third grade, third grade classroom. He was in a separate setting, so a special education classroom. And he would actually escape his class a lot and run away and come to my classroom. <laughs> and just spend some time with us for a little bit before going back and his classmates would do the same so it was like a lot of it was just very comfortable being in each other's classrooms it was great it was a good time uh, that's definitely beautiful that there was all that inclusion because I've taught in uh in uh schools where there is a special ed class but we're kind of kept the, 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 our classrooms were kept kind of off in the corner we weren't allowed to really interact with the other uh, neurotypical classroom. So that, that's really, really cool to hear. Yeah, um, like accidental inclusion. And yeah. I've definitely seen that those other types of settings too, even in my work too, even to the day. And it's really unfortunate to see. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, so, uh, so it sounds like you're saying you would like to see um, to have these classrooms more integrated. Yeah. Um, how would schools, in your opinion, go about in integrating uh, autistic classrooms into regular classrooms so that both autistic uh, children and neurotypical children can interact more? Yeah, so I actually did quite a bit of work on this uh, during my PhD program. I worked with schools across the state of North Carolina um, and teachers specifically on training them to do this exact thing, to uh, spend more time in more inclusive settings. So think of inclusion as an activity that's embedded in the day, whether that is mm -hmm. if you are in a separate setting classroom, getting your students out to do more extracurricular uh, classes, which is something we do see a lot more happening happening more often today, but also maybe across uh, clubs and lunch, getting your students out to those settings can be great, but also bringing peers into the classroom, going back to what we said earlier, what I was doing, that can make a world of a difference in terms of just changing the culture of a school. Uh, we do, there's like an evidence-based practice called peer-mediated intervention and instruction. I think I may switch instruction and intervention. I always do that. But PMII essentially is working with a peer group where there is an autistic individual part of that group um, and there's some facilitation on the end of the teacher or a staff member like a paraprofessional 
and there's layers of support there. So there could be, depending on the student, of course, this is actually really great because it can be really individualized. So, so say like the student may not and need as much structure to have those structured interactions with other peers or in those peers may not need as much training um, that, that differs too. So there's a peer training component to it and then there's a structured component to it as well. So we saw a lot of these happen in we call them lunch bunches because they would meet at lunch typically uh, every so often very, on a fairly frequent basis, either one to two times a week. And that student would develop friendships with those peers in their group. Um, and then we also would see peer supports, which would happen in the classroom setting. So they would get partnered with a peer or a group of peers that they would be working with on an academic assignment, but also fulfill some of those social interaction moments too um, that tend to be a little bit more improvised in the in that classroom setting so those two points are awesome points to get us thinking about ways to uh, incorporate more inclusion and i love those through and through and what we actually saw from even just being in a high school for a year to two years which was the end of our project with a lot of high schools we saw the culture by high school change. Like by the end of the year, teachers were so on board with running these groups that like they had, one school had like 50 of them going on at one time and they kept training different kinds of teachers to get involved too. Like we even saw um, a computer science teacher get really into it too. And he had all of his students get really involved in, in some form or fashion. Uh, that's awesome. So, so while adults have um, the capacity to really understand uh, their students' differences, how do you pair narrative with students for uh, interacting with an autistic student? Because they're they're going to be to them odd or weird or whatever negative phrase. But how do you turn teach them like the more positive phrases to use? Um, yeah, that's a really good question because it's not really, we've just like assumed by putting people together that they're going to learn it. Like some students do pick up on it really quickly and others can really benefit from something like a training. Like we do have uh, for like some lunch bunches, we paired, uh, we gave like instruction materials to the teacher, the facilitator to give like it was like a prezi presentation with a little bit more information about like autism but maybe a little bit broader than that like uh neurodiversity in general and they wouldn't necessarily point out that student but they may say these are everyone's needs when they're in this group setting and then they would observe and facilitate it kind of from the side but not be over everyone's shoulders but just enough to hear what was going on and then provide ongoing feedback to those peers. So I think that's also key too, um, just to continue to support them along the process, but also s promote positive interactions and model what those interactions would look like too. So sometimes we did have a facilitator, they felt like they needed to step in a little bit more, like really model, like what do we want these social interactions to look like and how do we make sure that they're positive? And of course, make sure that that student still feels safe on top of everything, this, the student on the spectrum. Um, what ended up happening too was uh, teachers would uh, know which students would be the best ones to match with that student. Either they already had some displays of empathy and compassion or they were students that could get there with that support. And those would be also those inner circle students that could prevent bullying and other issues that could happen across the school day. Because what generally would happen is the students would see each other across the school day and it would be so awesome to see, just even catch it on the fly of them waving to each other and just uh, checking in with each other across the day if they saw each other. Uh, that's really great. And I, and I wish we had more of that here. Um, Me too. Uh, um, you also mentioned that you also work with adults. How do you feel adults on the spectrum are, are being included around North Carolina? Um, how has your nonprofit helped them feel more included in the adult world? That's, yeah, something is really on our radar right now, especially uh, since, yeah, I am in North Carolina, but our nonprofit does work 
on an international level, really, uh, through our resources and our research center. We provide all of those materials online, and then we have an online community. So that's where we're mostly having those great interactions there. And it is an inclusive community itself. So we have autistic adults or individuals who are older than 13 years old. So we do have some, I think, older teens in there as well as parents, professionals, and other people who are seeking to be allies if, if they're not already allies. So we have some peers in there too. Um, and that's just an inclusive space to be talking about growing up and navigating adulthood. And we have a lot of great conversations in there too about uh, what does, what would inclusion look like for you? Because I think inclusion is also a very individualized, contextualized conversation. Um, mm -hmm. And I wish there was more discussion about that as well. Uh, I think there are some things that we can do broadly in terms of the community, which is really tough right now with COVID-19 and uh, lots of isolation practices being in play, which really important for safety, but also can be really feel so defeating because of so many adults feeling like they have gotten to a good point of inclusion in the community. Like even my brothers, for example, we were kind of at a really great routine and schedule of uh, they attend a day program during the week on Monday, Wednesday, Friday from just the normal working hours. And then the other days of the week, I'm working with them too, but they're also going out in the community and spending time there, um, interacting with a variety of people at the gym or on the trails. Uh, they love going for walks and that's usually where they catch a lot of people pretty uh, frequently on a regular basis and we were hoping to get them out there to do some more volunteering and like 5k's because Tyler loves running and loves 5k's um, which is very opposite of me but mm. <laughs> he loves doing that stuff and we were about to get going to do that and just with everything shutting down as it did it really stunted us and I hope we we're able to get to that point where we can go back out and get them back on their feet again with that type of thing. And that's also something we've been hearing a lot in our community, our online community too. So we've been just getting into the weeds about like, what were some things you want to see come into play when you, when everything's over with? Uh, what are some things that we can get going behind the scenes or online that could eventually lead to meetup groups uh, professionally because we have uh, one member who runs um, an online, currently online, but he wants to make this in person, hospitality and tourism group in Maine, in Portland, Maine, and he wants, because he's all into the hotel industry and he's like, we need to get more autistic adults in this industry or get them in the know about it and connect with them. So that's something he wants to do more of or and also make that a broader group too of people who want to be involved with it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're just kind of doing a planning, we're in the planning stage right now and hopefully things will change in the future. Mm -hmm. All right. um, that's really awesome. And I'm having my own light bulbs go off in my head uh, and ways to help your organization. And for those of you who are following Tara, there actually is a social Thing that would be great for, that talks all about inclusion it's actually called inclusion festival oh yes um, that i'm on part of i don't know if you've heard of them yeah i've heard a little bit about them um, um so what it is, it's, a, it's a music festival geared towards um mainly autistic people but also other able-bodied uh, individuals where the music is turned down to a much lower decibel so for all, and there's um sensory zones and a place to, for people that in a peaceful way interact with people in the spectrum and adults like myself who are on the spectrum to meet friends and I think one of the it, the key things that I've noticed is a lot of organizations like you are mainly focused on employment um, but there's not so much about um, buying social situations that are acceptable for adults and I think Inclusion Fest and I think like we definitely got to get your organization to come up to Pennsylvania and have a booth yeah. and do some workshops. Um, I think your brothers would ab absolutely love it because there's there's a bunch of adults on the spectrum just running around and enjoying the music and the, the workshops that are, are really helpful. Yeah, we love the music. That sounds awesome. So Amy, if you're watching this, 
uh, the like we need to get this, this girl and her organization up up to Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, we'll be in touch. Definitely. definitely. Um, what do you think are the like the biggest challenges in terms of socializing for autistic adults that um, they're in in the world today? And also, how can not only autistic adults meet it, but also thrive in adult situations? Yeah, I think that's the key word too, right? Like thrive in social situations. Um, I hear a lot from autistic adults that they just feel like they are surviving or just trying to get through a social situation, not enjoying it, not really getting that much out of it. And they feel like they have to put a mask on to just make it through. Mm -hmm. um, so we do inadvertently focus on social skills and socialization. Um, just by supporting the individual where they are and like where they want to go next um, and really just like celebrating their strengths and their interests and using that as really the starting off point for uh, connecting with other people, starting conversations and um, using that to even just identify opportunities. So like a lot of people Still, unfortunately, society is really stuck on eye contact and having a good old handshake. And honestly, that's not really our priority. It's not my priority at all. And um, I just love that's reinforced by so many autistic adults. Like they don't feel like they have to do that with us. And um, we just want to accept the person as they are. And I love having extended conversations with so many of the autistic adults in our community and so many more people that I will meet. And um, I don't know, I feel like social skills and socialization, I am learning from the autistic individual themselves about what they want and what they prefer. And maybe if we have some things in the future, I would like that model to be autistic individual first. So like they would be the ones to lead that project or lead the way when it comes to uh, what are the things that are really important to be thinking about um, and to be accepting of just other diverse minds. Right, and I think, I think that's very important. And I think a lot of neurotypical people fail to understand that they want to enforce like their beliefs, their social norms, their, st their stereotypes on us because they think that will help integrate us more. Um, but not a lot of time is spent um, like flipping the script and like, why don't you come into our culture? And that's why I, I don't like calling autism a disability. It's a neuro culture. Mm. Uh, it's, like, it's like there's a neuro culture for bipolar people, a neuro culture for schizophrenics. And, you know, the list goes on for all the other mental disorders that yeah. I can think of right now. Um, and I think that, that your organization and Inclusion Fest are definitely a step in the right mm -hmm. direction of flipping the script and I think that's the biggest thing my message for autistic adults is you need to flip the script and bring the world into your world rather than you know being freaking miserable and um no. and trying to put that mask on if you want to be you you have to invite you know bring down your walls and let the world in if people think you're strange and they don't want any part of you that's okay because not everyone you know there's no rule saying everyone has to like you right Right. Not everyone is for you and you're not for everybody. Um, that's hard. Yeah, it's hard for neurotypical people too, I'm sure. But yeah. like, why waste your time and energy? And as, as I get older and older, I'm wasting my energy less and less on time that people with, on people that want nothing to do with me. Um, and then you feel happier and you feel happy in social situations when you're surrounded by people that want to be around you. And if you have trouble finding those people, create things like Inclusion Fest. Um, or you know, join Tara's organization, like so you can create those social situations that you are comfortable in, where you can be yourself. Um, because in college, um, the first big step of being an adult, there are social clubs that you can start, and it's an excellent way to meet people of similar okay. interests. Like, bring the people in. Stop waiting around for people to pull you in. Yes. Because um, you'll you can oh, be waiting a very very long time, or feel like it's never going to happen. So. So true. Yeah, I like that. Like, give yourself permission to do the thing you want to do and create the thing you want to create. Because, yeah, no one knows that you need it until you make it. 
Um, so tell me a bit more about your, your brothers. How, like, yeah. um, how are they with socializing and what are some of the some su successes they've had as adults? Yeah, so um, both of my brothers, it's really interesting because they are both so different, which makes sense, right? <laughs> every, right. It's a spectrum and every autistic individual is an individual. Mm -hmm. But they, um, they both have been in the same setting for the majority of their lives. They've been in that separate setting, special education classroom, self-contained. And um, they still get grouped together in terms of their supports. They, um, and inadvertently so too, when we got off the Medicaid IDD waiver wait list after waiting 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, they both get the same services, uh, which works out too though for our scheduling needs. But there are a lot of things that are just very different communication wise and social wise from both of them. They both are very different. Um, it's kind of funny too, because the way it works out with the siblings, it's, I told you four of us, but it's like paired off two and two because of there's such a huge age range between uh, Tyler and Tasha, who's the next child after him, our neurotypical sister. Um, also like to give her a shout out here and there because she's always like, what about me? I'm part of it. Mm. Uh, but so for Tyler and me, we're very similar. We're very, um, I would say calm and accommodating. And that's kind of like how he is socially. He loves um, saying hello to everybody who walks by on the street. Sometimes he doesn't get a hello back, so we always like to say hello to, to him. Um, and he's very much concerned with making sure that everyone is okay and gets what they need. Um, and he just enjoys a one, he like really enjoys one on one interaction a lot um, in a way like that includes like puzzles and doing word games and other types of games together. He really, really craves that type of thing. And he really loves learning and engaging that way. So that's often a good way that he likes to socialize too. And then Tanner is very much one that teachers in the past had labeled him challenging. And I think that has had an impact on him socially too, because he does put up a little bit of more of a guard. Um, he's the opposite from Tyler and me in that he is a lot louder. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's off, he's the youngest and he's the baby. And so that has also shaped him, his, um, I don't know, his dynamic in the household, I think. Uh, so with that guard though, I found that it's a lot easier to connect with him by talking with him about his own interests and that will get him so excited and ready to go and both Tyler's and Tanner's interests are Disney. Uh, Tanner's are more so Disney villains and like deep cut Disney movies like Rescuers Down Under and uh, the Aristocats so like Disney in the 70s and 80s and mm -hmm. As soon as you, they both like to script, and that's kind of like their main form of expression, communication-wise. Um, mm -hmm. Different levels of echolalia. So Tyler does a lot of immediate echolalia. So repeating back to what you just said, and that increases when he's a little bit more anxious. But mm -hmm. they both do a lot of delayed echolalia, where they are scripting and saying lines from movies and things that they're thinking about. And to get Tanner on board with you and to have um, just a brief social interaction, or if he wants to, he'll oftentimes initiate a an interaction too by just like saying one of his favorite Disney lines and he wants you to say it in a very expressive way. Uh, and it includes a lot of, uh, lately he's been so into Shrek. So that's another <laughs> one of his favorites, which really falls wonderfully well with like the pop culture uh, craze about him lately. Cause there's so many videos and songs about like all-star and different versions. I don't know if you've kept caught on that, but we watch all of them. Oh man, yeah, so he, that's his main way of getting my sister and me for the most part really involved socially with him. Um, and both of them really, it's uh, it takes a lot of support and structure to uh, provide when it comes socially otherwise. So like with people outside of our, close quartered family. Um, we do provide like 
a lot of scripts and modeling with them. Um, and they're both fairly comfortable with like even just talking to people that I don't know that well, especially Tanner, which it can be so surprising sometimes. Like he's very good at like asking for help from someone if he needs help with something. Um, but they both can be quite difficult to understand at times. So we've over time and especially lately have incorporated communication devices at home just to get them in the practice of using it. Mm -hmm. it say if somebody else was working with them or if they wanted to bring it to their day program. Um, so that's, those are the main ways that they socialize for now. And then like maybe when they're out in the community, they're very quick to say hello and uh, talk with people, especially when they have a dog. Um, and that's a brief conversation and then they're happy to go on. Yeah. And then I'm going to uh, piggyback on what you just said. Um, for the, those people who have always wondered what echolytic behavior, what's the purpose of it? Mm -hmm. um, the big thing I want people to understand, my viewers, is that why we do it is um, the autistic mind is all about patterns. And if a pattern isn't completed, it's very hard for us. But at the same time, when we are anxious, completing a pattern in our head or verbalizing a pattern can help bring down our anxiety. So um, my biggest advice is let them complete the pattern maybe once or twice or three times, but know that it is a it is part of our language to help soothe us because we're always looking for patterns in, in the universe and in public and um, that, that it's not just like random thing. Why are you quoting Jafar? No, like they're quoting Jafar because it's they know line for line how it goes and they're trying to soothe themselves through the sound of their own voice. Mm -hmm. um, exactly yeah I so appreciate you getting into that further mm -hmm. and so like the big thing is like if you want to know understand your child on the spectrum or brother or sister is understand that when that comes up oh they're feeling anxious that is an opportunity for you to be empathetic uh, and show em empathy and help soothe them and get them back on track um, and that's another way like that I te help teach people I talk to about how to oh. communicate with us um, and it's important not unless it's like going on for you know an hour or something, not to in, in, interrupt it or else it's just going to go on longer and longer and longer. Yeah, because I I realize that, and I'm sure other people will too. Like if you the more you interrupt it, the more likely they're going to keep doing it because they're going to feel more anxious. Like it's just a mm -hmm. like it's a cycle. Right, and then uh, and a good tip is you know you can um, when I. Uh, have brought when I take clients out in the past into the community is bring like little parents they can do with their hands like completing a quick puzzle uh, just to quickly soothe them um, yeah. I, I even have my own little sensory bag where I have essential oils and uh, things I need to help stim subtly and I think the huge thing for adults on the spectrum that need to um, you know do the verbal stim or uh, stim in some way is picking a time and place to do that or mm -hmm. like learning to excuse yourself from the table, go to like, if you're in a restaurant, for example, and go to the stall and, and complete those patterns in the stall. That way you're not interrupting the whole meal by screaming Disney lines or um, whatever the vocal stint is. Um, yeah, yeah, we've certainly done that. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I would like to see, uh, that's great that you do that for your brothers. And I think that more accepting of our, our language, like the way we're starting to accept Spanish more into America's every day like i would like to see subtitles for autistic people like mm. i mean i'm not a language expert but that, i think that'd be really cool that would be awesome i would love so that if there's, any, if there's any language experts that um there please contact me and let's work together to create autistic uh, subtitles um because often autistic people struggle to fall plots of movies or like what people are saying if we could translate that mm. or vice versa if we start making our own movies we translate it for other people um, oh yeah we've made our own movies for sure yeah we're very into like making our own sequels or threequels of certain movies like Beauty and the Beast Gaston's Revenge that was a movie <laughs> that Tanner created um, and also kind of he put together interestingly enough so like YouTube it's like so interesting how many people have made Disney videos or um Incorporated it's so it's I don't know how to describe it exactly, but I've seen so many Disney variations where they'll be like, This is Beauty and the Beast, but the Beast is played by 
this character from The Incredibles, like, right. so cool. And so Tanner incorporated a lot of those to make his own movie. Um, and I just filmed it and edited it, and it's up, and he's very, um, it, it was like a nice way to get in his head to, uh, to get those subtitles out. Um, yeah. on the screen somehow. That's, yeah, that's a beautiful way to incorporate his interest in teaching him to communicate in his own ways because autistic people are very visual. Um, our language is completely visual where neurotypical's language is audio. Um, for those of you who don't understand that, um, basically a neurotypical brain processes words first and then associates it with the image. For an autistic brain, it's the complete reverse where we see the image first and then the words come after. Uh, for example, if I say the word barn, I'll see the red building and then the word and associate the two. Um, and I think that's an excellent way for autistic uh, kids and adults to learn to communicate and for neurotypical people to understand language. So just reverse the way you think and you can understand actually a lot of what your siblings or children are actually saying. Because we're talking, it's like we hit fast forward and rewind, you know, we're going in one direction or the other. So just reverse whatever you're, th you're thinking we're saying, and all of a sudden you'll understand, oh, that's what they're talking about. Yes. Yeah, that's so key. Such great advice. Uh, so um, I always like to wrap up my interviews with the following question. Um, if you could change the way the world sees autism in one way, what would it be and why? Hmm. That's such a good question. Um, that's a really tough one because I have a lot of things. I have like a laundry list here. Uh, I wish that more people understood that they are a part of the autism equation mm -hmm. and that they can be a part of an autistic individual's life. Um, and they are huge uh, in terms of that they can make an impact just by the way that they support people who are different from them and think differently mm -hmm. from them. Um, the way, because we see so many poor outcomes in adulthood across employment, education, and independent living, um, those are all not just like individual areas. I think we have the tendency to just say, oh, that person didn't get enough preparation or support, which still really needed while they're in high school and they don't have the skills to get to those places. But actually a lot of that change happens from around them. It's a systems level change mm -hmm. that can really shift the, the books there. Um, they are part of the equation in that they can change what that system and the environment looks like um, and to be more inclusive and accepting of autistic people and neurodiverse people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, that's awesome. How can people get involved in in your nonprofit? First off, what's its name and how can they get involved? For those who Yeah. Are... So the name is Autism Grown Up. Uh, everything about us is housed on our website, which is autismgrownup.com and it's grown like all grown up. Mm -hmm. And um, you can con contact me there. We have all of our resources housed in our resource center on our website from our podcast which I'll have to get you on and yeah. our blog and our online community that I was discussing at length about all easy to access there and then we do have some programming coming up um, I'm always working with families and autistic adults to work in identifying their next steps and put together a roadmap for adulthood and we're all over social media so whatever social media platform you use you can easily find us at autism grown up all right tara thank you so much for coming on, on my show today all okay. right folks this is uh sam here saying off please subscribe to my channel below um i hope you guys are having a great time uh stay strong everyone um you know, just think in love, not fear during these weird times. Um, all right. This is Sam Huber signing off of Heroes of Autism. Thanks, Sam.